Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you've gathered us together this morning, and we pray that you'd be preparing our heart to receive the message you have for each of us, Lord. Lord, as we look at the life of Caleb and just his character, Lord, and his love for you, how he was a spirit-filled man and just followed you all the days of his life, even at the end of his life, Lord, and just help us to learn those lessons. And Lord, as always, as we come before you to worship you, may we worship from our heart, Lord, out of love. May these songs we sing unto you not only just honor you, but may they draw us into your very presence, that we can cast all those things that are heavy upon our heart at your feet that we can receive from you this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Would you please open your Bibles this morning to Psalm 119, verses 81 through 104. My soul, wait, my soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from seeking your word, saying, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment in those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongly. Help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances. For all, for all, for all are your servants, unless your law had been my delight. I would have been perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours, save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me, but I will consider your testimonies. I have seen the consummation of all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from ever, from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I have not departed from your judgments, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 14 as we continue our study through, I think, an amazing, amazing book on victorious Christian living. And we've been looking at the division of the land, first of all, on the east side of the Jordan River River for Reuben, Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh. They were outside the promised land. And then we're going to be looking at the tribes on the west side of the Jordan River in the promised land. And we're going to see that as we read on uh, in future chapters here. But this morning, and really the main point I want to focus on in our study here in Joshua 14, is the character of a man named Caleb. In fact, I've called this study Character Matters. And when we look at character today, that seems to be lacking many times. You know, you look at politicians who, you know, say one thing and do another thing. Uh, we see it with Hollywood, and many times the, they lack so much character. Um, and then we look at what takes place even in the workplace. And we can go on, but what is character to us? What does that mean? 
Uh, I like what Noah Webster defined it as. He said, by way of eminence, distinguished or good qualities, those who are esteemed and respected and those which are ascribed to a person in common estimation. In other words, someone you can trust, someone who's honest, someone who does the right thing. That's the idea. Now, what does the Bible say about Christian character? Well, let me share this with you because, you know, as we look at the life of care of Caleb, we're going to see that he was a, a man who loved the Lord, and that love just came flowing through his life and everything that he did. Not a perfect man, but boy, he was a man who had good character. Let me share this with you, and then we'll move on. But character is defined as strength of moral fiber. A.W. Tozer described character as the excellence of moral beings. As the excellence of gold is its purity and the excellence of art is its beauty, so the excellence of man is his character. Persons of character are noted for their honesty, ethics, and charity. Descriptions such as man of principle and woman of, woman of integrity are assertions of character. A lack of character is more de moral deficiency, and persons lacking character tend to behave dishonestly, unethically, and uncharitably. A person's character is the sum of his or her disposition, thoughts, intentions, desires, and actions. It is good to remember that character is gauged by general tendencies, not on the basis of a few isolated actions. We must look at the whole life. For example, King David was a man of good character, although he sinned on occasion. And although King Ahab may have acted nobly once, he was still a man of overall bad character. Several people in the Bible are described as having noble character. Ruth, Hanani, David, and Job. These individuals' individuals' lives were distinguished by persistent moral virtue. Character is influenced and developed by our choices. Daniel resolved not to defile himself in Babylon, and that godly choice was an important step in formulating an unassailable integrity in the young man's life. Character, in turn, influences our choices. The integrity of the upright guides them, Proverbs 11.3 says. Character will help us weather the storms of life and keep us from sin, Proverbs 10.9. It is the Lord's purpose to develop character within us. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart, Proverbs 17.3. Godly character is the result of the Holy Spirit's work of sanctification. Character in the believer is a consistent manifestation of Jesus in his life. It is the purity of heart that God gives becoming purity in action. God sometimes uses trials to strengthen character. We also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, persever perseverance character, and character hope. The Lord is pleased when his children grow in character. You test the heart and are pleased with integrity. We can develop character by controlling our thoughts, practicing Christian virtues, guarding our hearts, and keeping good company. Men and women of character will set a good example for others to follow, and their godly reputation will be evident to all. Again, good character flows really from an accurate knowledge of God. I want to share a couple things with you about the founders of our country because they understood this. And just listen to, you know, I guess so much today we're, we're told that this was never a Christian nation, that uh, they were not Christians who founded this nation. That's not true. Listen carefully. The Constitution of the State of Massachusetts, 1780. The governor shall be chosen annually, and no person shall be eligible to this office, unless at the time of his election he shall declare himself to be, the, be of the Christian religion. All persons elected to the state office or to the legislator must make and su subscribe to the following declara declaration. I do declare that I believe the Christian religion and have firm persuasion of its truth. Can you imagine that today? Are you kidding me? They'd be laughed out of that, that. Believe me, there'd be lawsuits everywhere. This is the Constitution of the State of Pennsylvania, 1776. And each member of the legislature, before he takes his seat, shall make and subscribe the following declaration. I do, do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good and punisher of the wicked, 
And I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. We have churches that don't even believe that today, right? This is to get into office. Constitution of the State of Vermont, 1786. And each member of the legislature, before he takes a seat, shall make and subscribe the following declaration. I do believe in one God, the creator and governor of the universe, the rewarder of the good and punisher of the wicked. And I do acknowledge the scripture of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration and own and profess the Christian religion. Incredible. You know, how we're not taught this anymore, are we? Lastly, the Constitution of the State of North Carolina, 1776, and these are just a few, that no person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion or the divine authority of the Old and New Testaments shall be capable of holding any office or place of trust or profit in the civil department within this statute. In 1835, the word Protestant was changed to Christian. Why was this so important? Because who's leading your people? What kind of character do they have? Look at our politicians today and look at the character that they have. Look at the things that go on in Washington, and it's so sad. Now, does that mean every single person in Washington is evil? No. But boy, we just turn on the news and we hear what they have to say, and it's not good. And I think the reason this was so important was because they wanted men who were surrendered to God. He was the authority figure in their life because if he was the authority figure in their life, then what flowed from their life would be the things of God, good character. And again, they weren't perfect men. People will say, well, yeah, but look at some of the bad things they did. Well, of course, everyone. The heart of man is evil. We, we all, I mean, if we, if God was able to, and he is, I guess, to put on a video, our life, everything, not only that we did or will do, but think, how many of you would be for that? What do you mean, none of you? Of course not. There's the grace and mercy of God. The thing is, what flows from our lives as we surrender to him should be good character, the things of God. And this morning, I've kind of broken these verses down into three main points. And verses 1 through 5 of Joshua 14 is the tribal boundaries. And then in verses 6 through 10 in Joshua 14, Caleb's character. And Joshua 14, 11 through 15 is Caleb's request. And let's just dig in. Joshua chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, is we look at this issue of character matters. We're told these are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine tribes and the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half-tribe on the other side of the Jordan, but to the Levites he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and they gave no part to the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property. As the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. We saw back in Joshua chapter 13 the division of the land on the east side of the Jordan River, those two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, the half tribe of Manasseh. And tragically, they had rejected God's offering of the land of Canaan, the promised land. And they decided, look, this is better. It's fertile. We've got all these cities here that, you know, we've defeated these people. Now we just are going to move in. Tragically, they were the first ones taken into captivity. But here in Joshua 14, and really continuing on through chapter 19 of Joshua, the division of the land is now for the nine and a half tribes on the western side of the Jordan River in the promised land. And Joshua, Eliezer, the high priest, representatives from each of these tribes on the west side of the Jordan River were supervising the casting of lots for their land. And back in Numbers 34, verses 16 through 29, 
Moses gave instructions on how the land was to be divided, the officers or representatives who would oversee it. And Jewish tradition tells us that the name of each of the nine and a half tribes of Israel were drawn from an urn, and simultaneously the boundary lines were drawn, but we don't know for sure. But God was in control. And the reason I say God was in control is what Proverbs 16.33 says. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Absolutely. It's always the case. The key is, are we listening to what the Lord is telling us? And that's so important. And Joshua is explaining that the tribe of Joseph was divided into two according to the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim, because the Levites didn't get an inheritance of the land. The Lord was their inheritance. And so there's still 12 tribes if you divide the tribe of, uh, or split Joseph to Manasseh and Ephraim, his two sons. The dividing of the land was so important to them, these tribal boundaries. But again, this morning, what I really want to dive into is this guy named Caleb, because he's an amazing man. He was from the tribe of Judah. And the character that comes forth from this guy as you read this, and you, you read in, in uh, 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 Deuteronomy and, and, so, and Numbers, you see this guy, man, what a character. And so look at verse 6. We're going to look at the second point, Caleb's character. Look at verse 6 here. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to you, said to Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he has said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. Now there's two points in these verses that I want to bring out regarding the life of this man named character, Caleb, his character. And again, specifically, we're looking at his character. But the first point is Caleb walked in the Spirit. In verse 8, it says he wholly followed his God. He was a man filled with the Spirit, and he was able to walk the way that God wanted him to walk. We see in Numbers 14, 24, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. You know, Caleb was one of those 12 spies that spied out the land of Canaan during the time of Moses. And remember, he and Joshua came back with a good report. The land's great. Let's go get it. But the other 10 spies said, yeah, the land's great. But, you know, there's giants in the land. They've got fortified cities. This is not good. We're going to die. We're like grasshoppers to them. They're going to squish us. Not a good thing. We can't defeat them. And those 10 spies convinced the entire nation not to go where God wanted them to go. And that whole generation from 20 years old and up died in the wilderness, not entering the promised land except for Joshua and Caleb. Caleb walked in the spirit. He followed the Lord. Interesting, his name Caleb means wholehearted. You know, he didn't follow the Lord when he wanted, when it was convenient for him, when it would work out for him. He didn't follow the Lord half-heartedly. Caleb followed the Lord wholly or wholeheartedly. And that's what we need to do. What does that mean? Well, Paul in Philippians 3, verses 13 through 14 said, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying, look, my focus, my concentration 
is on the Lord. I'm not going to let anything get in my way or distract me from what God has called me to do. Remember when he was speaking to the Ephesian elders and he was told over and over again, hey, you're going to Jerusalem, they're going to, they're going to take you captive, man. You're in trouble. Chains await you there in Jerusalem. Paul said, look, none of these things move me. Why? How could he say that? Because he was focused on the Lord. He was walking in the Spirit. He knew where God wanted him to go. In fact, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see, what is the focus of our life right now? Is it upon the Lord? Are we focused on what we're going to do when we get out of church here this morning? You see, Caleb was a man who was just focused on the Lord, and thus he followed the Lord because he submitted his life to the guidance of the Spirit of God. He had a different spirit than the others. I mean, to be filled with the Spirit means to be constantly controlled by the Spirit in our mind, our will, our emotions, and our actions. You know, Paul said, you know, that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. There's the, the call. It's a battle every single day. You know, David said in Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. What's he talking about? Well, think about it. If the Lord is our shepherd, what does a shepherd do? He leads the sheep. So by keeping the Lord in front of him, that means he's following the Lord. And that's what we need to do. Wake up in the morning. Okay, Lord, this is your day. You're my shepherd. I'm going to follow you. Show me what you want me to do. Show me where you want me to go. Are we willing as Christians today to go against the flow of the world and wholeheartedly follow the Lord? Because, you know, you look at this world today and there is such a push to conform us into the ways of this world. Do you doubt that? Look at what's going on in Europe. Look at what's going on in Canada. You try posting something that's Christian in Europe, and you could be in trouble on Facebook. The world wants us to think and act like them. What's their mold? Ungodly. It's an ungodly mold. I want to be transformed by God. I don't want to be conformed to the things of this world. And I will tell you, it's a battle from the moment you get up to the moment you go to sleep. Because the world is constantly trying to draw you in. And if you've uh, never read the book um, Big Brother, I read it now. Because this is what's happening all across the world. Check out China. Was it Big Brother? 1984, I think, with Big Brother in there, 1984. Check out what's going on in China. You don't conform to what they're saying, look out. You get rights taken away. There was a reporter that had posted something against the government. He lost his traveling rights. He lost, he lost his job. He lost everything. That's what's going on conforming us to the things of this world. And unless you're willing to submit yourself to the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be tough. Unless you're willing to say, Lord, I realize my stance for you is not going to be easy, but I want to follow you. Give me the power to do that. Empower me to live the kind of life, because I don't want to live half-heartedly with you. I want to give my whole heart to you. I want to live fully for you. And here's another issue for some of us who are getting older. Is that we get complacent. We get complacent, don't we? Well, you know, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm 60. I'm not middle age anymore. Eh, how many more years do I have? I'm just going to relax and kick back. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing battle. Caleb's 85 years old. 
And yes, the battles were intense. They went on for seven years, but they're not over. And think about it. How do I know he was 85? Well, it says that. Caleb was 40 years old when he went to spy out the land. The wilderness wanderings were another 38 years, which would make him 78. And now he's 85. The conquest of the land probably took seven years. And then the land was divided, as we see here. Caleb didn't grow weaker as he got older. He grew stronger in the Lord. And I think that's what God desires of us, to continue to grow and mature in him, to trust in him more, to fight those battles even against the giants. You know, we may be growing older, but may we never grow weak because we're in Jesus. We can walk in the Spirit and be empowered by him and see the amazing things that God can do in us and through us as we completely surrender our lives to him. So Joshua, I mean Joshua, Caleb, I even put that in my notes, Joshua, because we're in the book of Joshua, but it was Caleb, walked in the Spirit. The next point I want to bring out is that Caleb believed in the Word of God. How do you know where to walk? How do you know what to do, right? In Joshua 14, verses 9 and 10, we're told, So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance, speaking to Caleb, and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he has said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. He believed in the promise of God that this land in Canaan would be theirs, and specifically that he would inherit this land. He trusted in the promises of God. How did Caleb know the land was theirs? Think about it. I mean, was there a contract that the land was going to be given to them? No. There was no evidence that they would ever have this land. How did they know that God was going to do this? By faith. It was all a walk of faith. Crossing the Jordan River, that was faith. When Joshua took him across, the waters parted. Remember, the priest brought the ark in the middle. The waters parted. They walked across. Jericho, walking around Jericho, the walls come down. That was faith. It's all a walk of faith, trusting in God's promise to them. Turn back to Numbers for a second, chapter 14. Go to the left, go past Deuteronomy, and then you'll get to Numbers chapter 14. We're going to pick up in verse uh, 26, where we're told this. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, Just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness, all of you who were numbered, according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, I will bring in. And they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your son shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation, who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness they shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land, those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive of the men who went to spy out the land. Lack of faith kept him from entering the promised land. Boy, I want to have faith. I want to trust what God has said 
has told me. I want to walk and see the things that he wants to do in me and through me. Here, Caleb's faith in the Lord and the Lord's promises to him brought him into the promised land. And think about Caleb. Okay, God said this, right? He's 40 years old, 50 years old, nothing. 60 years old, nothing. 70 year old, not 70 year old, nothing. That could get frustrating, right? God promised, what happened, Lord? What's going on? What's taking so long? I think Caleb just trusted in the Lord. You made this promise until this generation. We got 40 years in the wilderness. Until this generation is gone, we're not going to enter in. But God promised me that he would bring me into the land and not only bring me into the land, but defeat the enemies so that he can give me my inheritance of the land. Wow. There was no expiration date on the promise that God made. He believed it. And for us, many times, it's easy to believe God's word until things get tough in our lives. And I'm sure we all experience that. You know, everything is fine. Everything's good. And then all of a sudden, it's just a mess. God, where are you? Um, he's right there. He's, he will never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, what are you doing? That's a good question. Help me, Lord. Show me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to learn through this. This is hard. My heart's broken. I'm overwhelmed. Don't you think Caleb, I mean, I, I know some of you guys like camping, but 40 years of camping with, you know, 3 million people doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me, okay? 3 million people. It's not like you're just a couple people out there. But Caleb trusted the Lord. And no matter how hard it was, he believed in God's promise. And I think today is... You know, you look at Christianity, and again, I'm not speaking across the board, but many times what happens is we've taken God out of the picture. We've taken the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do out of the picture. We've replaced it now with programs and ideas on what we want to do instead of what God wants to do. There was a recent nationwide survey, complete, survey completed by the Barna Research Group determined that 4% of Americans had a biblical worldview. Four percent. My, we've come a long way. We're told that when George Barna, who had researched cultural trends in the Christian church since 1984, looked at the born-again believers in America, how high do you think it was that they had a biblical worldview? Just take a guess. Nine percent. Nine percent of born-again Christians. Born again. We're not talking about Christians in general, because that's kind of a loose term. Everyone, you know, a lot of people are Christians that aren't. These are born-again Christians, those that say they believe. Only 9% had a biblical worldview. He said, although most people own a Bible and know some of its content, our research found that most Americans have little idea how to integrate core biblical principles to form a unified and meaningful response to the challenges and opportunities of life. A worldview is the framework from which we view reality and make sense of life and the world. It's an ideology, philosophy, theology, movement, or religion that provides an overarching approach to understanding God, the world, and man's relations to God and the world, says David Noble, author of Understanding the Times. For example, a two-year-old believes he's the center of his world. A secular humanist believes that the material world is all that exists. And a Buddhist believes that he can be liberated from suffering by self-purification. Someone with a biblical worldview believes his primary reason for existence is to love and serve God. And you see, if that is your point of view, if that is your reference, then everything you do will stem from that. But if you've lost that biblical worldview that your existence here is to love and serve God, guess what's going to happen? Your existence will be to love and serve yourself. And that's what we're seeing a lot today. He goes on, whether conscious or subconscious, every person has some type of worldview. A personal worldview is a combination of all you believe to be true, and what you believe becomes the driving force behind every emotion, decision, and action. Therefore, it affects your response to every area of life. 
from philosophy to science, theology, anthropology, the economics, law, politics, art, social order, everything. For example, let's suppose you've bought the idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, secular re relative truth, as opposed to beauty as defined by God's purity and creativity, absolute truth then any art piece, no matter how vulgar or abstract, would be considered art, a creation of beauty. A biblical worldview is based on the infallible word of God. When you believe the Bible is entirely true, then you allow it to be the foundation of everything you say and do. That means, for instance, you take seriously the mandate in Romans 13 to honor the governing authorities by researching the candidates and issues, making voting a priority. Do you have a, a biblical worldview? Answer the following questions based on claims found in the Bible and which George Barner used in a survey. And these are them. Do absolute moral truths exist? Is absolute truth defined by the Bible? Did Jesus Christ live a sin sinless life? There's many that deny that. It's not what the Bible says. He did. Is God all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe? And does he still rule it today? Is salvation a gift from God that cannot be earned? Is Satan real? Does a Christian have a responsibility to share his or her faith in Christ with other people? Is the Bible accurate in all of its teachings? Only 9% of born-again believers believe that. 9%. That's heartbreaking. You know, do we really believe the truth of God and live it? Because if not, our witness is going to be confusing. It's going to be misleading. How do Christians support abortion? Because they don't have a biblical worldview. That, that's the only explanation. Every life is important. And we live in a, a world today where we have different groups of people. No, there's only one race. It's called the human race. And I don't care the, the shade or color of your skin. It doesn't matter. You're part of the human race created by God. But see, what we've done is we've divided people up and now we've got people fighting against each other. It's wrong. Do we want to be conformed to the world or transformed by the renewing of our minds into the men and women God wants us to be? That was Caleb. He loved the Lord and he obeyed the Lord. He followed the Lord. And thus, you know, we have to stand upon the word of God and obey it, live it, believe in God's promises to us because it's that important. Now, I'll just give you a couple verses to show you the importance of trusting God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Now here's the thing about the people in Thessalonica. They heard the word of God, they believed the word of God, and that's where it ends for many. I heard it, I believe it, I know it, I can quote scripture, I've got it all down. They lived it. They lived it. The word of God was part of their lives. Were they perfect people? Absolutely not, because there's no one who's perfect except Jesus. But they took in the word of God. And they knew it was true. They applied it to their lives. They trusted in God's promises, and they lived it. We need to do the same. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We don't make the word of God say what we want it to say because we have no right to do that. We have to rightly divide the word of God, the truths of God. In fact, rightly divide in the Greek speaks of to cut straight. It was used of a craftsman cutting a straight line or a farmer plowing a straight furrow. Can, can you, you know, you look at the cornfields, right? You can tell how they're planted. I mean, wow, just follow it right along. 
Could you imagine if he went like this, you know, zigzagging all over the place? It's not straight. And that's how people do with the word of God. Oh, I'm going to take you over here. We're going to go over here and I'm going to put this out there. No, you got to rightly cut the word of God, rightly divide it. Also of a mason setting a straight line for bricks. I think the problem today is many times is they may, many make the Bible say what they want it to say. I went to a church years ago where one of the leaders in the church was for abortion. I was a new Christian. I couldn't understand it. I, for the, I scratched my head. I, how could that be? It, it goes against everything that I know. And I'm a young Christian. Maybe I, I'm missing it. No, I didn't miss it at all. They did. Not rightly dividing the word of truth. In Hebrews 4.12, Paul said, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is not just a book. This is the word of God, and it's living, and it's powerful, and it's able to transform our lives. That's the amazing thing about this. The spirit of God reveals things to us. I don't know about you. You know, when I'm doing studies... There are times that, yeah, God pierces my heart. When you're here, maybe that's what God's doing with you. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is sharing something with you, and it just pierces your heart. It goes, wow, I never thought of it like that. I'm sorry, Lord, I was wrong. That's what God's word does. In fact, Isaiah 55, 11 kind of follows this idea. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. The only one who could stop the work of God in your life is you by not listening, by not applying it to your life. Be open to what the Holy Spirit is showing you. Job in Job 23.10 said, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You know, I think for most of us, We've got the physical food down pretty well, right? Especially here at Calorie Chapel. We love to eat. But spiritual food, do we, take, do we hunger it as much as we do for physical food? We should. We need to build up the inner man. We need to grow. And what God has for us is so important for our lives. You know, I've said this before, but man, you know, you may have read a passage 5, 10, 15, 20 times before. All of a sudden you're reading and it's all of a sudden, wow, I have never saw that. That is, wow, what happened? The Holy Spirit opened it up to you. In fact, Jesus said about the word in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, your word is true. Is there absolute truth out there? Absolutely there is. It's called the Word of God. And if you rightly divide the Word, you cut it straight, you're not going to be led astray. And we need to take those lessons that God is showing us and apply them to our lives. And it will set us apart from the morality, the lifestyles of the world. We don't want to be conformed to the world. We want to be transformed. Will we stick out? Absolutely. Why do you think the apostles and the followers of Jesus, many were put to death in the early church because they stuck out. They were so vastly different than the world, and the world tried to silence them. Did they? No. Within 30-some years, the gospel message went out throughout the whole known world without you know, newspapers and televisions and you know, Facebook posts and tweets and whatever. I don't even know what a tweet really is, but I know it's out there. That's how old I am. James said in James chapter 1, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Ah, oh, receive God's word into your life. Apply it. Not just the reading, but the application is so important. And we see that with Caleb. He believed the word of God. He applied the word of God to his life, and so must we. Paul was a man who was spirit-filled. He was obedient to the word of God. He lived what he said he believed. 
And at the end of his life, he said, look, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The guy's in prison, ready to be put to death for his faith in Jesus. And look, I, I fought the good fight. I know my life's over. I finished this race. I'm heading home. I've kept the faith. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to encourage Timothy to continue on in the work after he's gone. Paul was a man of character. Caleb was a man of character. And we need to be men and women of character. Now look at Caleb's request, starting in Joshua 14, verse 11. As yet I am as strong this day as I was on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kerjath Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest for more. What did Caleb say? Give me this mountain over here. Wow. Very specific, right? It wasn't a prayer like, you know, Lord save everyone in the world, amen. We need to be specific in our prayers. Not telling God what to do, but we should be specific, like Caleb was. I want this mountain right over here. Now, you may be thinking, well, I don't want any mountain, man. I don't need that. Well, think of mountains as areas in our lives that are just overwhelming, that are huge, that we don't even know how to tackle. In fact, in Mark 11, Jesus, in verses 22 through 24, answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but he believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, yes, people have taken that to unbiblical conclusions, but they do a lot with the Bible that way. What is Jesus talking about here when he speaks about praying for mountains to be removed? Is it a physical mountain? Well, I mean, he's God. It could be, right? But that's not necessarily the point that Jesus is making here. Uh, I think, again, the key is those obstacles that are preventing us from doing the things that God wants us to do. And this is not a get-whatever-you-want prayer. The reason I say that is because in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15, John put it like this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That's why when we pray, we always say, Lord, your will be done. I know what I want. I know what I'm praying for here in this situation, but Lord, I always want your will to be done because I know that's the best. It may not be the easiest, but it is the best. And so the first thing we need to do is pray in the will of God. And do we pray for these mountains to be removed from our lives? I think many times we just give up. You know, if we got a headache, we have no problem praying, right? You know, Lord, just take the headache away. You know, it's going to go away eventually. But what about a terminal illness? What about losing your job? What about your marriage on the rocks? What about on and on and on we can go? There's no way, there's no hope, there's nothing. I, I just give up. Oh, you could pray with faith for a headache, but now this problem is beyond your grasp and you can't pray. Exactly. It's beyond our grasp. I can't do it. But God never said, Joe, I want you to take care of this. He said, I will take care of it. You need to walk by faith. You need to pray. You need to seek my direction. Prayer is so important in these days we're living in, guys. E.M. Bounds put it like this. The problem that he saw in his day, and he lived from 1835 to 1913. This is what he saw. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods. 
but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer. Men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow, flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plants, plans, but men, men of prayer. So think about it. Whatever is going on in your life right now, maybe this huge mountain, <laughs> snow, snow-capped, right? It's huge. Are you praying about it? Are you asking others to come alongside you and pray with you? Because you're not going to move it on your own, through your own efforts, but God can, because he's God. Caleb didn't say, hey, you know what? There's a nice little hill over there. Can I have that one? Give me that mountain. And you know who lived in those mountains? Giants. Okay? I mean, I'm like, you know, give me the little munchkins, okay? Because I'm a giant to them. No, he goes, give me the giants on that mountain over there. He's 85 years old. Wow. Not an easy task from a human perspective. Not a lot of hope from a human perspective. But Caleb knew the Lord. He walked in the spirit. He trusted in the promises of God. And what God had promised him, he was more than able to bring to pass. And he made the request and he trusted in God. I hope this morning that you are encouraged that those mountains can be removed. And it may not be removed in the way that we think, but God has a plan. He has a purpose in our lives. And can we trust him and walk by faith and lay it at his feet? You know, Paul in Hebrew said, you know, that we can boldly go before his throne of grace. I'm so thankful, Lord. I don't even know what to do anymore. I don't even know how to pray anymore. But I'm giving it to you, Lord. I'm just trusting in you. And I, I, just help me to have faith and to know what to do, what to say. 85 years old. Talk about a tough dude. I mean, wow. He didn't give up. He wanted to finish the work that God had called him to do, to take this land, even though there were giants living there and fortified cities. One writer put it like this. He was not in his old age and advancing years seeking a soft spot or comfortable little corner of the country to settle in. No, no, no. Instead, the tough, grizzled old war horse was prepared to take a whole rugged mountain range for himself. It was the stronghold of the sons of the ferocious giants of the Anakin. He was not a man to shrivel up in fear at this late stage of his life. Give me this mountain, he exclaimed in an outburst of triumph. Just as my strength was then, So now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. When we pray, guys, may we be specific in our prayers. Again, not telling God what to do, but be specific. You know what you want to pray for. And Caleb's prayer was a great prayer. You know, it wasn't give me the hill, give me the mountain with the giants. In Jeremiah 33, 3, the Lord said, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Wow. That's an invitation, isn't it? The Lord said, Hey, you know what? I, I don't want to be bothered with you. You know, if you got something to say, speak to Gabriel. No, he said, Call to me and I'm going to answer you. And you know what? I'm not just going to answer you. I'm going to show you mighty things, great things. You don't even, you can't even imagine what I'm going to do. Are we calling to him? Are we trusting in him? God wants to do great things in us and through us, but we need to call to him. We need to ask him, and he will, we will see the salvation that he'll bring to the situations that we face in our lives. And the key is always that it has to be based upon the word of God. You can't ask God to do something that is contrary to his word. When Caleb asked the Lord for this mountain to be removed, it was according to what the Lord said to Caleb. 
Deuteronomy 136. Except Caleb, the Lord said, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked, because he wholly followed the Lord. Now Caleb is just acting on the promise that the Lord had given to him. What about family members that aren't saved? Oh, they're never going to get saved. I don't know. Did God die? Trust in him. Just keep praying for them. God doesn't desire any to perish, that, that all would come to saving faith. He won't force anyone. But don't give up, because that's just what the enemy wants you to do. He doesn't want to see people saved. He wants to see them go to hell with him. Don't give up. Trust in him and his promises. And Caleb was fearless. And I like that. You know, before they entered the land, the Lord spoke to the children of Israel. And this is what he said in Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 through 3. He said, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go into dispossessed nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them as quickly, destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. What I like here is that the Lord starts out and says, you know what? You're going into a land where, man, these guys are bigger, stronger, mightier than you, cities that are fortified. These people are great and tall. They're descendants of Anakim, the giant. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? That's how he starts out. This, I'm thinking, how are we going to win? You just told me that these guys are better than me. That would be like me trying to play professional football. You might as well call 911 right away. That's what the Lord is telling them here. You guys, this is bad. Who could stand before these guys? They're giants. Listen to what he says. Therefore, understand that today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Wow. There's the victory. Not in me. What do I have to do? I have to walk by faith. I have to trust in the Lord and walk by faith and see the victory that he's going to give me in this situation. You know, I read that and I go, Lord, do you have anything besides those areas where the giants are, man? Fortified cities. You know, maybe just a couple people living in tents would be nice to go and attack. But no, the Lord says, this is what you have to do. But remember, I'm going in before you. I'm a consuming fire. I'm going to wipe them out. But you have to walk by faith. That's the perspective we need to have. God promised them this land. He was going to give it to them, but they had to walk. And so do we, by faith. That's what Caleb's doing. And he was fearless. Another point we need to put into practice that we see in the life of Caleb is that he was confident. And I'm not saying that he was confident in what he could do. He was confident in the Lord and what the Lord could do in his life and through his life to move the mountain that was before him. You know, when I first came up here to Manitowoc, I was confident in what the Lord told me. I knew he was going to bring me to Wisconsin because he told me that. But when I first came up here to teach, uh, and I, I told the, the elders, look, let me teach for four Sundays. You pray about it. I'll pray about it. Let's see if this is what the Lord wants. I knew that first Sunday when I taught up here that this is where the Lord had called me to be pastor. And in knowing that, in knowing what the Lord had told me, I had confidence, and I've had confidence for these last 24 years to continue on in the work, even though there's so much opposition to the work. I, I do need to be reminded from time to time when there's a lot of opposition, it's because the enemy doesn't want you to move forward. Just the reality. But I know what God promised me. So because obstacles that are in my way, does it stop me? No, it, 
it gives me confidence that I'm going to have to bring it before the Lord and trust in him and see the salvation that he's going to bring to the situation I find myself in. In Joshua 14, 12, we're again told, Now therefore give me this mountain on which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord had said. Basically, what Caleb is saying is, look, I'm going to walk by faith and see the salvation that the Lord is going to bring to this situation, how he's going to remove those mountains, remove those giants, give me this land that God had promised. Steps of faith. And lastly, Caleb was humble. He wasn't proud in his accomplishments, but he was proud in what the Lord had done in his life, how the Lord had preserved him all these years. He said, it may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. It reminds me of what James said in James 4.10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Pride will bring you down. If you think that God can't survive without you, you're in trouble. But praise God that he uses people like us to bring glory and honor to him and to bring the gospel message to a lost and dying world. You humble yourself before God, he will lift you up. And really the conclusion is simple in verses 13 through 15 here in Joshua 14. And Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron, therefore, became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron formerly was Kerjath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the the land had rust for more. God gave Caleb this victory and removed that mountain in his life just as he wants to do in our life, if we let him. May we be men and women of good character. May we be men and women who are filled with the Spirit of God. May we be men and women who are specific with our prayers before God. May we be men and women who pray great prayers. May we be men and women whose prayers are based upon the Word of God. May we be men and women who are fearless. Ah. Oh. In these days, we need to be, guys. May we be men and women who are confident, not in ourselves, but in the Lord. And may we be men and women who are humble, realizing here we are just by the grace of God, not because we're so special, but because he is. What mountains do you want God to move in your life? Have you given given those mountains to him? Have you laid them at his feet and said, Lord, this is what's going on? Because you need to. And again, character is so important in our lives. And as the things of God fill our lives, as we dig into God's word, as we surrender to the spirit, godly character will flow from our lives as we see here with Caleb. And I'll close with these words from Warren Worsby. He wrote this. We are never too old to make new conquests of faith in the power of the Lord. Like Caleb, we can capture mountains and conquer giants if we wholly follow the Lord. No matter how old we become, we must never retire from trusting and serving the Lord. Amen to that, right? I want to finish the race strong. You know, Jesus said, occupy until I come. Continue doing the work until he comes back for his bride, the church, until we go home to be with him, whatever comes first. Serve the Lord fully. Be men and women of good character because people are looking at you. And I'll tell you, if you have a wishy-washy faith, who wants any? Who wants that? But boy, if you have a faith that is wholly committed to God, people are going to watch that. They may not agree with it. They may say things that, the, that are not very nice, but they'll see that you are wholly committed to God. And you never know when God's going to touch their heart because of how you shined before them. Never give up. I don't care if you're 20 years old or 120. Serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this example, this godly man, this man who truly trusted in you and lived out his faith. And help us to be men and women who are like that, Lord. Just trusting in you, living for you, and people see that. That we don't have a secular worldview, but we have a biblical worldview. And we're ready to stand upon the things we believe in. 
not compromising our faith, but Lord, living totally for you, Lord, shining for you, that we may draw others into that saving faith. Thank you for being our God. And Lord, for any who are struggling here this morning, who may have huge mountains going on in their lives that are so overwhelming, that, Lord, they be able to lay them at your feet, receive your refreshing spirit, and trust that you will take care of those mountains. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.